from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today, K-State's A.J. Tarpoff will talk about managing heat stress in cattle during these hot summer days. Among several things, he'll take up when that stress tends to peak during the day and making adjustments in the feed ration and feeding schedule to lessen that stress. Then K-State's Brad White and Bob Larson will take up two topics, assuring that the cow herd has adequate access to clean water on summer days and storing newly baled hay to preserve its quality. Today's Wheat Harvest Update features Extension Agricultural Agents Ryan Flaming of Harvey County and Ron Honig of the Wild West Extension District in southwest Kansas. And further ahead, this week's horticulture segment. All that here on Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. For openers on this edition, we'll look at heat abatement for cattle. Joining us is beef veterinarian A.J. Tarpoff of K-State Research and Extension for although, A.J., we've had cooler conditions, thankfully, in recent days we are bound for hotter weather and the impacts of heat stress can be extraordinarily telling on cattle at this time of the year, right? It really can. And we're right in that peak area, the you know time of year, summer months. Uh, a heat wave is never more than a few days or even a week away. Uh, so it's always good to be prepared. Heat stress is a big factor to consider with our cattle operations, uh, all cattle. It's been estimated that we can lose up to $370 million a year of loss of production to the cattle industry, the beef cattle industry, just due to heat stress. We have reduced intake. They're trying to abate heat. They're panning. They're, they're trying to cool down. It actually increases their maintenance energy. As for cattle out on pasture, reproductive efficiency and performance, sometimes our fertility actually drops during the peak heat times of the year. Uh, so there's, these are all factors of why we have these massive losses. And if, if conditions are extreme enough, we may have a potential for mortality uh, in some of those kind of more stressed uh, populations that we have in our herds. It is an issue, is every summer. So to get at how to relieve heat stress in cattle, we have to know something about how that heat actually builds up in cattle. And uh, it's a multi-layered thing, isn't it? It really is a multi-layer. So cattle, okay, most of the heat load that accumulates in the animal, each animal within a group or a herd or a pen, they're not affected the same way. Uh, So we have uh, more of our at-risk classes of animals. Uh, Those would be animals with higher body condition scores. Okay, some of our finished steers or finished heifers getting ready to go to harvest. Darker hides. If you ever got into a a dark colored or a black car, you know, right in the middle of summer, you know what I'm talking about. So darker hides will accumulate more heat load, okay, as opposed to some of the uh, lighter colored animals. On top of that, any animals that have had a previous BRD insult, uh, bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia, they're more at risk. And I think that's important to understand uh, because those are our at-risk groups. Uh, Heavier, darker-hided animals, maybe with uh, winter hair coats that may not have fallen off if we brought cattle in from a more northern climate. Those are our at-risk groups. Okay, so we have the environmental conditions that increase heat load. And that has to do with temperature, humidity, solar radiation. Those three factors are really critical and when we start measuring heat load. Now, how cattle dissipate heat has very much to do with evaporative cooling, okay? We think about, you know, humans, we sweat. We sweat profusely. The wind comes by, it takes that, and we have evaporative cooling. It pulls that heat away uh, as those sweat droplets uh, dissipate into the atmosphere. Uh, Well, cattle, while they do sweat, they only sweat about 10% as much as what people do. So that's not the number one proponent of how they dissipate heat. It's actually through breathing. So as temperatures rise, they increase heat load, they will start breathing faster, they may begin panning more, and that's all about dissipating some of that heat through tiny droplets through the respiratory tract. So that's how they dissipate heat. 
Is there a point in the day where that heat load is at its apex? Uh, how soon do the ill effects kick in, to put it that way? Okay, so uh, so this this all has to do with heat load. Now, a good frame of reference to keep in mind, whatever the hottest point of the day is. So, for example, if it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon was the peak temperature for the day. The peak internal temperature of our cattle will peak two hours after that. So they will continue to increase and actually accumulate heat even as the temperature starts to drop. So if the, the peak temperature is 4, guess what? About 6 p.m. is where those animals are, are hottest internally during those external environments. The other thing that we often don't think about is the heat of digestion. Okay, we feed cattle and the fermentation within the rumen actually produces heat. We call it the heat of digestion. And it will produce the maximum amount, amount of heat from that meal about four to six hours later. So if we feed animals at the wrong period of time, we can actually have an increased heat load because the heat of digestion and the heat from the environment are kind of maximizing on top of each other. And we want to try to keep that from happening. While we're on that point, though, do certain ration compositions lend more to that heat buildup then? It does. So not all of our ration compositions are the same. And they're a little bit opposite when we talk about heat production uh, than what we generally discuss when we're talking about nutrient requirements. Believe it or not, very high fiber, very low quality feeds like uh, straw or low quality prairie hay, those have the highest increment of heat production. Okay, so animals that are on lower quality forage based diets will actually have increased heat loads from that digestion. Animals that have higher starch, maybe fats and oils, very digestible forages such as uh, silage, really high quality alfalfa, things that get digested really rapidly don't produce near as much heat. So when we talk about hot rations, usually we're talking about levels of starch and energy. That has nothing to do with the heat production of fermentation when we're dealing with heat stress. So now we come around to what can be done to alleviate some of that stress in a management sense. And, and perhaps feeding time and ration can be modified to get to that goal. Mm -hmm. So to start with management considerations of dealing with heat stress, I think we need to get back to the basics. Handling, right? Just handling animals can actually accumulate their heat load. So if we have new arrivals, if we need to uh, ship cattle, if we need to move them in any means around the feedlot, we need to try to do that in the cooler times of the day. Okay, so we're not uh, we're not adding more heat load, especially during those hot critical times. Uh, so if you do have to move animals, if you have to process animals, if you have to re-implant animals through the processing barn, try to have all that done and wrapped up by about 10 a.m. is a good frame of reference. Past that, you know, we were discussing feeding. And one of the easiest, one of the biggest ways that we can combat heat stress is modifying our feeding times. One way that we can do that is we can feed about 70% of that animal's ration as late in the evening as we can. So that will put the peak heat of digestion overnight during the nice cooling nighttime hours. Uh, so we can kind of split those heats to make sure that we're not uh, layering those on top of each other during the heat of the day. The other thing comes down to kind of basic heat stress management. Okay, pen density. If more animals are grouped up in one location, they can share body heat. Okay, and they can actually, they're, they're not able to dissipate it. Uh, so if we can split pens or if, or if we can reduce stocking density, that's a, a great way to do it. Unfortunately, just due to the market constraints, we may not have a ton of available pen space right now. But reducing stocking rates is, is one way that we can do that. The other big thing is just managing the pen environment itself. We want to maximize airflow. Okay, we want to try to keep that environment as cool and as comfortable as possible. And here's a couple ways we can do that. Uh, one, to maximize airflow, again, back to the basics. If there are tall weeds or if there's anything obstructing wind or slight breezes through the yard, we need to make sure that we get those knocked down. We're trying to provide as much airflow through the yard as we can. Providing mounds, earthen mounds that actually uh, rise up above the pen floor. Cattle will utilize these and catch lighter uh, breezes that, uh, that rise just above maybe 10 or 12 feet above uh, the pin floor space, they can catch different types of breezes up there. Uh, so that's another way that we can do it. Uh, shade structures, uh, you may have seen these in a lot of different locations around Kansas. They're much more common further south, uh, but they're becoming more popular. Again, shade structures, uh, they're a phenomenal way to be able to reduce the solar radiation, reduce the pin floor temperature during the peak heat times of the day. But it is 
an investment. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind. If this is something that you're considering, one way to start is if you want to see how they're going to impact your own operation is to be able to utilize a shade in some of those most at-risk classes of cattle. Okay, whether those are our finished cattle or maybe our sick and chronic pens where we're trying to rest and recover certain animals, those would be a good area to start if you were going to look into shades. One of the last ones that we always comes up is sprinklers, yeah. right? <laughs> so it seems to be the the natural response. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, we can just wet them down. Well, now sprinklers are a great tool if they're used correctly. Number one, we have to have the water capacity. Okay, we need to be able to have the water availability to be able to utilize sprinklers like they should. Droplet size is actually critical with these sprinklers. We don't want to mist it. We don't want to fog it. But we do want pretty large water droplets to be able to wet the pen surface. And that will allow actually evaporative cooling to cool the pen surface and cool some of the animals. Now, if we use these during the heat of the day, unfortunately, we can create a microclimate of really high humidity during the hottest parts of the day. Uh, so one, one thing that we can do is during the nighttime hours or the very early morning hours, if we have low humidity, we can utilize these sprinklers to help cool the pen surface, cool the animals without forming pools in the pen to form you know, more humid environment. Uh, so that, that would be one of, one of the better ways to use sprinklers is we use them to help cool the pens and cool the animals themselves. And there's one more thing that we shouldn't overlook, and that is quite obviously as well, AJ, water for consumption. Oh, yes. So uh, to put it into perspective, we will bump from 70 degrees to 90 degrees in temperature. Cattle will consume about double the amount of water. And and that's pretty extreme. So how much water do animals consume? A good rule of thumb is about five times the dry matter intake they're consuming. So however many pounds of feed they're, they're consuming on a dry matter basis, uh, their water needs for that day is about five times. Uh, so cool, clean, readily available water is critical during uh, heat stress events. Once more... It's time that you geared up your heat abatement strategies for your cattle, particularly in confinement. But again, even those on pasture need consideration along these lines, too. And AJ, thanks for covering all of this with us. Always a pleasure to be here. That from Beef Veterinarian, K-State Research and Extension, AJ Tarpoff. We'll return shortly with more on the K-State Radio Network. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. This is the K-State Radio Network, and next up on Agriculture Today, more conversation from the team at the Beef Cattle Institute here at Kansas State University. Every week they get together to kick around timely topics in the area of cow-calf management, that on the BCI Cattle Chat podcast. This time it's in the hands of K-State veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson. Eventually they'll take up the subject of storing newly baled hay. But first, Brad and Bob take a look at one of the essentials of getting the cow herd through the summer grazing season— Daily water requirements. Bob leads off by offering what he thinks that requirement would be. See, I was always taught 20 gallons. I don't know if that's on the high side or that may just be, that may be a safe number, but I'm going to say 20 gallons. I would think a little lower, but knowing that it goes up and it's so, it's just like, a, right? It's yeah, different it on a hot on day that. versus a, a day where it's cool or you've got humidity versus a dry. So I mean, lactation yeah. takes a lot of water. Well, lactation takes a lot of water, and ah, body weight matters, right? Well, yeah. So are they, are they thin or fleshy or not? Some of the guidelines that I found looking this up before the show, you'll see recommendations anywhere one gallon per 100 pounds in the wintertime to two gallons per 100 pounds in the summertime. So, Bob, you're 20 gallons. It'd be about right for a 1,000-pound cow. Uh, we don't have very many thousand pound cows. Uh, and it really could be that high, especially if you think of really hot days and the need for water. Lactating may require a fair bit more water than non-lactating cows. So 
that could be 1.5 to twice as much water. So when you think about that on your herd, you're going through a, a lot of water in the summertime. And when we evaluate how much water supply we have available, we need to be sure that we've got enough water, not only for them to drink and meet their requirements, but also they don't just drink water throughout the day because they're out grazing, right? We're out grazing in the summertime, and Bob, you've talked about that before. Capacity becomes important. Yeah, you know, and then as when I was in veterinary practice, we had to work with several situations, and, and you should recognize that you can have a decrease in performance, but also some real health issues if cattle don't have enough water. And that can be very different in different parts of the country in that as you go to some of the areas of the country where you have large pastures and they're more arid, having a lot of water stored up because the well capacity may be such that if all the cattle came to a, a water source at once and this was well water, the well might not be able to keep up with a large group of cattle. So you've got to have that water stored ahead of time. And so things like the well capacity, you know, gallons per minute that the well can provide, the storage, you know, so you've got enough for that 20 gallons per head. And if the cattle all come up to drink at once, having all of those gallons available in a short period of time. And, and again, we had some veterinary students here from different parts of the country. And that was interesting because you had some students from the western part of the United States where that was what they were used to was Cattle come to get water once a day or so, and they're all going to hit the water tank at the same time. So a lot of linear feet for each animal. And then we had students from an, uh, southeast part of the United States where maybe they're doing some management intensive grazing. So the cattle are never very far from the water. But again, water well capacity and water source is still really important. It's just they may drink throughout the day versus hitting at one time. So some real regional differences, too. Yeah, and you don't notice those capacity things until you, until you have, and it's really think of it as a surge capacity, right? Mm-hmm. So if so if we have all of them come up at once and they're going to be hitting it, that's important. And and we've talked quantity, but also the quality of that water is important. And I, I'm going to start simple here with when, when we go to ponds versus you talked about well water, Bob, or filling up a, a tank or you've got an automatic water system out there, there's different abilities even to maintain the cleanliness of those. Obviously, we're not going to do a lot with the pond, but those tanks in the summer, it's pretty important because they get, they can have issues pretty quickly, depending on what size tank you've got and how frequently you clean it. But also the water that's coming in there, what do you think water quality? Well, you know, let's start with just the basics. So, Again, whether it's, um, you know, a, a tank or an automatic water or something like that, you've got to make sure that it's clean. And, and again, the basics, the basics, because you could have wildlife using that water. You don't want dead wildlife in the water tank. Uh, you don't want a lot of dirt, debris, manure. And then, yeah, I agree that ponds, I'm not really concerned about some of those same issues. There's two issues with ponds. One is just access. If we have a year where where drought is a problem and so the water retreats and you've got really muddy access up to the pond, cattle won't drink as much and some of them will have difficulty getting there. And the other thing is, and and I hate to mention it too much because I don't have much expertise, but blue-green algae and some other things that can grow in the pond that are issues. So yeah, it's not just the quantity. I think quantity is really important. But uh, you've got to have quality water, so cleanliness and what I can do as a producer to maintain a clean and accessible water supply. Bob, I want to, I want to switch topics. Let's talk hay storage. So we're getting hay cut. We're getting it put up. People are, are making round bales and square bales. But I want to talk about round bale storage and how much does hay storage method impact wastage? Yeah, and, and again, it depends a little bit on, on rainfall, part of the country you're in. You know, as the drier parts of the country, you certainly have less loss during storage if hay is stored outside. But in a lot of our country, a lot of the United States, there's enough rainfall that you can have quite a bit of loss during that storage if the hay isn't covered or, or handled appropriately. How, about, um, how and, much of the, let's talk some specifics, how much yeah. of the bale is in the outer six inches? Yeah, one of the things, it's really amazing that 30% of the bale, almost a third of the bale is in the outer six inches and a full 75% of the bale 
is in the outer 18 inches of a bale. And that's just the way, you know, a circle works. You know, most of the circle is right along the edge. And so if you have... It doesn't you know, take much spoilage to lose a no, third of that bale. No, it does not. You know, and, and that's what you really have to keep in mind. And so, again, I'm, I'm going to really be directing this towards parts of the country where you have quite a bit of rainfall and you're worried about, you know, that storage loss. And so some of the things that we talk about are, and a lot of that loss actually comes up from the ground. So you're trying to put the bales on a rock base so that they're not leaching moisture from the ground. We like the, the bales to be headed north, south, north, north, south, north, south, not east, west, because if you go east, west, the north side of the bale always stays in the shade. So if you run the lines of bales east and west, you'll have more loss than if you line them up north and south. And so then, you're and saying then, line them up north-south, butting them end to end, yep, yep, them so end that end the end. row runs north and south. And then you would want to have, if you're doing multiple rows, you want to have enough space between those rows so that the sunlight can dry them out. So one of the challenges with water is, you talked about the ground, but that water also falls from the sky, right? <laughs> and if that water falls from the sky, soaks the bales, and they're so close to each other that the sun can't dry them out. The faster it dries them out, the less wastage we have. So north to south and, and multiple rows, but space those rows about one bale's shade width, if possible, yeah. between the two. So that when the yeah. sun is coming from the east, the bale in the row that's just to the west is not shaded by that. So I, th I think that's a, a great example. And we're talking about this is, if you're storing them outside, if you're storing them inside, yep. yeah, don't worry about Does, this. You're, doesn't you're saving. And, and under plastic or under a roof is, is really a good way. And, and again, we're talking about quite a bit of loss here. So kind of in the worst case scenario, in a part of the country that has quite a bit of rain, if you're um, putting bales on dirt close together, you know, not allowing them to, to, uh, to dry out very well, you could easily lose a fourth of the bale in storage. That's before you start losing some during the feeding process too. And if you kind of put it, well, if you put it under plastic or a barn roof or something like that, then you're talking just a couple percentage points of loss. So huge difference in the amount of loss. And then kind of in between, I put it on a rock base, run the bales uh, north, south, do all of that. Now you're talking 10 to 15% loss. So kind of figuring out your most cost-effective ways but manage that loss. Because if you go to all this work to put up hay and try to put up good quality hay, uh, you want to, to maintain that. The geometry is what fools you because I think all of us have probably picked up a bale and you see that bottom four or five inches fall off or slough off onto the ground because it got too wet. And you go, wow, that wasn't very much of the bale. I've still got most of it. But if you lose six inches around the outside, you lost 30%. So yep. excellent, excellent tips there. And that, as always, we appreciate you joining us today. If you have any questions, comments, things you'd like us to talk about on the next podcast, please send us an email at bci at ksu.edu. From the latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast, K-State veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson. On that podcast, they also take up summer fly control. Among other topics, hear it in full at ksubci.org. That's ksubci.org. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Now, this break, when we come back, today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Report. Keep it right here, won't you, on the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today returns now. Eric Atkinson with you, and on we go to our next Kansas wheat harvest update. Once more, we're leaning on the input from county and district extension agricultural agents from around the state, tapping them for their observations on harvest progress and results. 
Today, we'll catch up with harvest activity in Harvey County, the central part of the state, and talk with Extension Agricultural Agent there, Ryan Fleming. So, Ryan, you say that you were off to a good start with cutting, but then the rains came to interrupt the pace, you say. Yeah, we were probably going pretty good for a day or two, and then we had some pretty good bands of rain move through and slow us down a little bit. But from what I've heard, it's looking pretty good that's coming in so far. So if you were to guess, how far along are you in harvest? How much do you have left? Oh, we've probably got, I'd say, 70 80% left, somewhere in there. But you say that the early returns to cutting have been pretty good. How so? What sort of numbers are you hearing? The high end, I've heard fields doing uh, 70s to 90s, uh, but that's probably some of the best situations. Um, I would say, on average... I'd probably guess Harvey would probably pull in a 50 to 60 bushel of an acre average this year would, would be my guess. Well, if that holds up for the rest of your harvest, you would have to chalk it up as a really good year then. Yes, uh, I think so too. How about test weights? Have they been matching those kind of numbers? From what I've heard, uh, mid-60s, so pretty good. Not bad at all. So what's been the driver there? Um, I think we had some... We caught some moisture in the right time to to get it going. I know in the fall we had some iffy areas where not all wheat came up when it needed to, and it didn't. It had to wait until some late winter, early spring moisture to come up. I think that's kind of slowed us down a little bit on the harvest. Not all of the wheat was mature at the same time, but I think we've had some fortunate weather this spring to kind of help the wheat along pretty good. So even that late emerging wheat has done relatively well, as you've seen it so far? Yeah, so far. Um, we'll probably learn a little bit more how that's doing once it dries out now. It should all be pretty mature by the time combines start rolling now. It wasn't a real bad year for that. So is this one of the better wheat stands that you've seen in Harvey County in quite a while? Yeah, it's definitely better than it has been in the last couple of years. So I think this is definitely a nice year for the wheat farmer. So it's a good story coming out of Harvey County, and uh, we appreciate you giving us a quick recap of what's happened to date, and good luck to your producers in really getting going here soon. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. He's Ryan Fleming, and he is the Extension Agricultural Agent in Harvey County, Central Kansas. Now we'll hear from Ron Honig, Extension Agricultural Agent in the Wild West Extension District that covers Stevens, Seward, and Haskell counties in far southwest Kansas. First things first, Ron, how far along are your producers in cutting? How much progress has been made to date? Well, pretty much in the south part of our district, they're pretty much starting to finish up. I think there are uh, a few Irrigated fields that are still a little bit green, so they're getting those finished up. Most of the dry land wheat has been cut out in the, the southern part of the of the district. As you move north, you're probably getting into most of the dry land is cut, and they're looking at probably 40 to 50 percent completed on the irrigated wheat. And then as you move a little bit further north up uh, in the northern Haskell County, you'll see a little more dry land yet to cut and, of course, more irrigated. As far as your dry land fields are concerned, the expectations going into harvest, what generally were they saying that because it's been extraordinarily dry in your part of the country? Yeah, I think everybody was kind of interested to see how uh, the dry land was going to turn out. We basically went into the fall pretty dry. We had some moisture in the lower profile, but the top several inches uh, were dry. So the dry land producers, you know, if they were able to get their wheat seed down in moisture, then they, they established a stand and, and got some tillering in the fall. But unfortunately, we had a number of dryland fields that basically went into winter bare or, or thin and patchy. And uh, generally, we were dry till late December. I would say, like to tell a story, we at uh, Christmas Day, I watered my lawn and watered my trees. And then on December 27th, I got an inch and a half of rain. <laughs> basically, that was the first good rain that we'd received in months. So as we moved into January, then, then we got some a couple heavy wet snows, and that basically uh, was the, the moisture we needed to get some of those dryland fields to actually uh, emerge and uh, start to get some spring tillering. Mm-hmm. And we actually had some fairly good spring tillering out here. 
How did that translate then into production? What kind of numbers are you hearing on uh, not only yields but test weights? Well, I think some of the poorer fields that, of dry land that uh, were still patchy, they pretty much got grazed out or they were destroyed. Mm-hmm. And the better fields that the guys went ahead and continued with, we're seeing dry land yields reported 25 to 35 bushels an acre on some of these dry land fields, some as high as 30 to 70 bushel. So some uh, that maybe had a little bit moisture or guys were really conservative with their moisture, did a little better. And again, some of those late emerging, thinner fields, they're going to drag down the the overall average. So dry land yields kind of hanging in there, but kind of spotty. Uh, some are limited irrigation. Uh, those fields probably going 45 to 60 bushel an acre. And then what we might call a full irrigated field, we're looking upwards to 90 bushels an acre and then a few in the in the 100 bushel range. Would you say then that the uh, performance of this year's crop probably exceeded expectations to a certain degree? Yeah, I think people are satisfied. I think for the type of year that we've had, and especially coming in this last several weeks, we just had relentless hot, dry winds. And I think people were concerned about whether that was going to knock our test weights down and how that was going to affect yield and maybe some of those those late developing berries, if that was going to shrivel those up. So I think for the most part, I think people are going to be uh, are satisfied with the, the yields that they're getting. Well, it's good to hear that there were some successes with wheat in southwest Kansas, where in so many cases it was looking pretty bleak in that region of the state. That's not to uh, exclude the fact that some fields were abandoned, as you said. So if uh, the weather remains relatively cooperative, do you anticipate harvest wrapping up in the relative near future there in those three counties? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, probably another week will knock out a lot of it if we... uh if the weather stays uh, dry enough to let guys cut. We've had a few small rains that have had a few delays. But, yeah, by another week to 10 days, we should see it, uh, everything knocked out. Ron, thanks for the summary right here. Appreciate it, and uh, good luck to your producers finishing off the harvest here in 2020 down your way. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Ron Honig is the Extension Agricultural Agent serving that three-county area. That would be Stevens, Seward, and Haskell counties in southwest Kansas. They make up the Wild West Extension District there. That is our look at the wheat harvest progress in Kansas today. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This Agriculture Today concludes with our weekly horticulture segment. And time once again to find out what's going on insect-wise in lawn and garden, courtesy of our guest, horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, K-State Research and Extension. Raymond, welcome to you once more. And the one thing we want to remind folks about is that if they are carrying out a series of treatments against bagworms on their evergreens, they ought to be getting those final applications on pretty soon, should they not? Absolutely, Eric. I mean, we're actually still seeing some small bags uh, eighth an inch, quarter inch, and of course that's a susceptible life stage. So you can go in with uh, your dipel or your spinosad, which we recommend. They're stomach poisons. And again, you're going to have to make a weekly applications for about two or three more weeks, I would say at this point. Of course, that'll be contingent on weather, temperature, rainfall. But this would be a week to go out there when the sun is shining. And if you see bagworms, uh, use one of our uh, selective stomach poisons You want to thoroughly cover all plant parts and then, of course, wait the next week and see what happens. But again, at the very minimum, three treatments, maybe four. Is that the mindset here? I think we're uh, this is the last week of June, Eric. And I think if we get back to the warmer temperatures, I would say probably two weeks of spring. If it cools off, it could be an additional week beyond that. Yeah. So carry that to the fullest here, that treatment against bagworms, so you'll have full success. Otherwise, Raymond, folks will be left to hand removing those bags, which is an option. But if you have a larger evergreen, it's not as simple. Yeah, well, 
I would say after three or four weeks when the bags get close to half an inch, Eric, then you can use a pyrethroid based insecticide, mm -hmm. the bifenthrin, cyfluthrins. However, they kill everything. And so you just got to be cognizant. But yeah, if you're dealing with the larger bags before they, we call the green cap, brown cap stage, you can use those. Very well. Now, some other pests that we'll highlight today, including fall webworm on select landscape trees. Tell us about yes, it. Yes, uh, we're seeing the first generation fall webworm, uh, seeing damage on redbud, mulberry, and birch. They create these nests in the trees, and unlike eastern tent caterpillar, they stay within that nest, which consequently makes them harder to control. What I recommend, if you can, is, is prune it out, burn it, put in your compost pile if it's active, because it's hard to get them with sprays because that nest protects them. So either live with it or prune it out. That's pretty much the recommendations for that, Eric. What does a fall webworm look like? Uh, the webs are very telling. Anything else that people can go by here? Yeah, the webs are very telling. These are Right now, they're probably about half an inch. They're cream-colored caterpillars, with black dots on their top, two on each side of the abdomen. They create like skeletonization, but the damage is where the webbing is at, and that's where they're feeding. And like I said, when they feed, the web travels along with them and then provides protection from predators, parasitoids, uh, spray application, things like even birds. Even birds have trouble. So. In, the, in large trees, like we see in the second generation of walnuts and hickory, you know, you just live with it or, or oaks. But on the young tree, like a young red bud, uh, they can cause substantial damage and you probably you should probably prune it out at that point. So then again, watch for fall webworm activity in those younger trees mm -hmm. and remove those webs. It's as simple as that. Take the steps to do so. Squash bugs in garden. What are you hearing about there, Raymond? Well, we're here and they're out, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, right now the people uh, looking for the eggs, the eggs are all red, golden. Initially, they're on the leaf underside and there is no uh, silver bullet. You have to turn the leaf over. You can squish them by hand. You can apply a horticultural oil to smother the eggs. And of course, that will lead to fewer nymphs and then consequently adults later on in the season. So, yeah, this is the time if you've got zucchini or squash, pumpkin, anything in the family cucurbitaceae, you need to start looking for squash bug eggs uh, on leaf underside. If you want to preserve the productivity of those particular cucurbit crops, get after those squash bugs right away. Now, now, now something you can also do, Eric, you can put little boards, uh, like two by fours or boards out in the garden, and the adults will hide under there, and you can lift them up and then vacuum them up, squish them, put them in soapy water. You can also do that. Last thing we'll talk of here, grasshoppers in various landscape plantings, presumably, maybe even in vegetable gardens. What's the nature of this problem? It's all the above, Eric. I mean, grasshoppers are feeding on ornamentals and, and vegetable crops. And, you know, we, we don't have any silver bullets for grasshoppers. I mean, you can spray, but because they come in, they're migratory. Uh, it's a continual battle. You can get a couple of uh, young kids with badminton rackets and go out there and maybe swat them. But really, it's just uh, just you almost have to live with them. Just plant some extra, you know, ornamentals or vegetables and do it that way. Yeah. There's no practical treatment against grasshoppers because of what their mobility. Is that the main issue? Well, they can hop around and the adults do fly. They have wings. But there's so much vegetation around that. You know, again, if you're spraying, you're going to have to do it on a continual basis. And really, because of their mobility, it's, you know, it, it's not one of the most effective methods in my, in my mindset. That's why I don't recommend it too often. Do what you can against them. That really is yeah. the message. There. <laughs> and what, what do we know about their longevity? Once they start to build up in sufficient numbers, do they stay around for a while, typically in the summer? They can, depending on the species and depending on the food sources available. Yeah, uh, we've had cases where they have they can last several months. But again, that'll be contingent on rainfall and temperatures and uh, host plants available for them. Well, let's hope that conditions turn to the point where grasshoppers are discouraged all the way around. Like you say, they can really ravage various plants with their feeding. Of course... Extension Entomology at K-State stands ready to answer any questions that homeowners and gardeners might have, Raymond, in as far as insect activity and what, if anything, should be done about it. 
Yes, Eric, we, um, the newsletter is still going out weekly, and we have lots of fact sheets. Uh, I just finished one on white flies and elm leaf beetles, so we're still with this COVID and not traveling. What do you do? You do extension publications. So we're able to update some, create some new ones. We still respond to email and phone calls when we can. Raymond, as always, thanks, and we'll talk again in a few weeks. Always enjoy it, Eric. Look forward to our next visit. That from horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd, on this week's horticulture segment for you. That's our time for today. Looking ahead to tomorrow's broadcast, we'll have K-State's Dan O'Brien aboard with his weekly observations on the grain market trends and once more another Kansas wheat harvest update for you, courtesy of our county and district extension agents around the state. Plus more right here tomorrow. Please rejoin us then. Meantime, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.